Hello, welcome to the Antiquarto, an online chat series produced by American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'm Brenton Simons, your host. I serve as president and CEO of the society. We are the founding genealogical organization in America, today serving almost 400,000 members and millions of online users in 139 countries. And we do this by making 1.4 billion records accessible at AmericanAncestors.org and through a multitude of other programs, both in person and online and publications. And as it happens, publications is going to be the topic of our conversation today. I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, a very distinguished genealogist and a member of our staff since 2008 at the Society, Kyle Hurst. Kyle has worked in a variety of roles at the Society. She has authored two genealogies, edited other books, published two portable genealogists, contributed articles to Vita Brevis, our online blog, and to American Ancestors, and uh, also participated in educational programs, both at the Society and at conferences around the country. And added to those credentials, she is now an award-winning author. And we're going to talk in a little while about uh, this wonderful book that she published with us, a genealogy that was recognized with an award of excellence from the National Genealogical Society. But without further ado, let me welcome Kyle. And Kyle, thank you for coming on the Antiquardo. We're turning tables because it was just a few years ago you interviewed me for a blog. That's absolutely right. I'm glad to have the chance to speak with you today. Uh, it was my 10 year anniversary actually that I oh, wow. interviewed you and one of the main reasons I wanted to interview you is you are quite the role model for me because you started Newbury Street Press, where I now get a chance oh. to do this every day. <laughs> well, thank you and, and it is it's a lot of fun being in this field and I'm so glad you are in Newbury Street Press and I would love for maybe to start this off tell our viewers how you got started in genealogy and then from that, maybe explain how you make our members' dreams come true in these wonderful publications. Well, I have a story that's pretty roundabout, I suppose we could say. The spark, the genealogical spark, came when I was a middle schooler, actually. I went on this epic road trip with my grandparents, siblings, and cousins. It was one of those summer vacations. You will never forget what I did on my summer vacation. And it was my first visit to Ellis Island. So I was the one that had the opportunity to listen to the audio tour there. And at the time, this meant a little Walkman with an audio cassette tape and headphones. These headset I'm wearing today reminds me of it, quite frankly. <laughs> so I'm walking through this historic building where so many of our ancestors went through the gates, down, up and down the steps and through the lines. And I'm listening on this little headset to these individual stories. So they are actors saying the words of actual immigrants that pass through Ellis Island. So it's that very personal perspective, that biographical one-on-one -on -one perspective that drew me in. And I had no idea at the time, but that was really the spark that led the way. And I thought I was going to use that spark in the museum field. So I went to school for museum studies. I have degrees in anthropology and history, but the places that I chose to volunteer and intern during this time ended up being two places that are really dedicated to genealogy. <laughs> so one place was here. I volunteered with the book conservator. So I had my hands on the physical sources that researchers use to find their families. And the other, I interned at the National Archives over at Waltham. So part of that internship was learning how to help patrons who were coming in to research their family history. And I got, the timing of it was such that I really got to witness the change in how digitization really altered the way that we do research and what was becoming more and more possible because of that, because of the indexing through databases. So those are the two paths that I took that ended up in 
working here because the book conservator actually put my name forth for a job when I had finished my museum studies program. It happened to be at this really exciting time here at NEHDS because we were gaining national headlines. This was when there were stories about the Helen Keller photo that was found in our archives and when there were connections being made between celebrities and politicians. So all of a sudden, NEHDS was back on everyone's minds and I was able to get my foot in the door <laughs> uh, <you laughs> and did, train myself up. <laughs> you did come at a great moment and I can't believe it's all gone by in a blink. I can't believe you've been on the staff uh, since 2008. But going back, I'm really interested to hear about the Ellis Island uh, angle. And you were with your grandparents, you said, on that? I was. I was with my grandparents who, it's really interesting what happens when you're a genealogist who comes into it at a younger age, I would say, because you still have that extra generation living. However, what happened in my family, both sides of my family, no one talked about anything that happened before. There were no family stories getting passed around until I came along and started asking questions. <laughs> and I were even they... went so far as recording their answers. Oh, did, now did. everyone has this information because I was curious. <laughs> Were they receptive to the questions? Oh, very much so. This, this particular grandfather that I was with, he grew up in Hoboken. So I heard stories about how he got a puppy from Frank Sinatra's mother. Wow. And later I learned that apparently Frank Sinatra's mother, who was a midwife, was my grandfather's midwife. Oh, so okay. all of these stories come out once you start asking. And I couldn't get my grandfather to stop once I started. <laughs> Well, you may have to write a book on that someday. I hope um, so. <laughs> which leads me to the incredible work. Um, Kyle is right now in the publications office at the Society. So you're, you're right in the nerve center of where our books are produced. Um, to, I, I like to put it as we make people's genealogical dreams come true because we research, collect, put together these amazing works. Can you tell our viewers really what you do to make these dreams come true? Oh, certainly. Well, it is very much a team effort. That's why it is interesting that I'm in this office. This is a production team office. So basically the bulk of my job is what happened before books pass through this office. I need to take whatever somebody does or doesn't know about their family, research, prove out the stories, find the sources that uh, other researchers are, are going to need to look at. And I need to compile all of that into a manuscript that somebody actually wants to look at, but will find useful at the same time. So I have to pull all the threads together and create that final manuscript that then is going to be turned into a book. But there's so much that goes into all these different threads. And one of the things that I've actually found that I like doing the most is thinking about organizing these books, how best to convey the information that people are looking for, but still make it interesting. So the book that we're talking about today actually we had it set up so there are some narrative chapters in the front that are giving some they're they're comparing some of the families so all of the patriots are talked about in one section the merchants are talked about in another so even though they come from different parts of the family we can compare and contrast them there and then the rest of the book goes in chapter by chapter is each is devoted to a different surname and then we take the genealogy down from the immigrant ancestor down towards the present in each of those chapters and then we finish off with the chapter that is dedicated to following the descendants from where those families have tied in together. So it's it's really interesting to think about how we have all of this information and we have to condense it down into a form that's going to be useful and interesting. Well, it is really a model genealogy and we'll get into it in a second. And you know, I, what I tell people, what we do really is publishing A to Z. We do everything, every aspect everything. from all the research, the writing, the editing, the designing, the proofreading, the indexing, the all the finessing that goes into producing a book, and um, and and we're really proud that that the books that the society publishes are award winning, and you are the most recent award winning author. Um, and I also tell people, and I'm sure you do too, every book is unique in terms of format. Uh, people expect a sort of template and there is no such, well, I mean, you could use a template, I guess, but, but 
we tend to do books that speak, uh, I think, very authentic, uh, authentically to whatever the family situation is, whatever stories we're telling. We tend to do a format that works well. And you just described the, the one you used in this book because you could group um, different branches of a family in certain ways. And it is, it is just turning to the book for a moment. It is, and by the way, here it is again, um, Charles Le Caron and Victoire Sprague and their ancestors and descendants. And there's some really colorful characters in this book. I remember members of the family telling me about them before we even began the book. And one of them, I just let me read a little bit from this because he's such an unusual, you are the envy of, of so many genealogists because you got to work on such interesting families and individuals and no one um, would be more interesting than Thomas Billis Beach, AKA Henri Le Caron, who served in the Union Army during the American Civil War and later became a British spy. Thomas's life of, of adventure brought him from England to France. He adopted his new Le Caron identity when he emigrated to the US. Having met his Tennessean wife during the war, the Le Caron family grew up in Illinois, along with Henri's career as a medical doctor. Spy, doctor, emigre, I mean, what more could you hope for to write about? Oh, exactly. This he was quite the character. So the, the story behind becoming the British spy was actually a family affair because he left his parents back in England when he ran away to France to get away from, basically he didn't want to be training up in the trades that he was supposed to be following along the footsteps of. So he runs away to France and then he hears about the civil war and that sounds exciting. So I guess we're just lucky that he chose the union <laughs> and he actually served for Pennsylvania, which he never really lived in. But he, by becoming a soldier, he became friends with fellow soldiers. And because he was pretending to be French, he was also pretending to be Catholic. So it was the Irish Catholic friends that he made in the Union Army. That's how he became a spy, because he heard about their plans to invade Canada on behalf of Ireland. And he wrote back to his father in England and said, somebody should probably know about this. So his father actually facilitated passing letters. So this information that was coming out of the US about the Irish to the British. And then the whole story came out because Henry ended up going back to England and testifying at the trial of Charles Purnell in 1889. And that's when he came clean about his role and how he had made up this name and made up this background for himself for all of these years. Quite an audacious uh, man, really amazing story. And there are other, in the, I'm also struck by other families in it, the Sprague's, three generations of American consuls at Gibraltar. That's quite an interesting family. Well, and what's more interesting is how they got started becoming, uh, serving the consul there, because Horatio Sprague went during just right around the time that the War of 1812 was starting. And he became a US hero all the way over in Gibraltar because he helped soldiers that had been impressed by the British over there. So he made a name for himself. And so then he started basically politeering, you know, becoming involved and he really wanted that position in the consulate. And so he becomes, and then his son follows in his footsteps, and then his grandson follows in his footsteps, and it's over 100 years of Sprague's at Gibraltar in charge. That's really remarkable. And, and then other connections into the high gentry of Boston, the Irving family, and the, the book is um, full of beautiful portraits by Copley and other artists. I mean, there's some really uh, really interesting families behind behind them. Oh, well, the Irving family in particular, you have three generations that come at the American Revolution from different angles. So you have the immigrant who comes over from Scotland in the early 1700s, and he's a merchant. So he gets wrapped up in smuggling because of all of the 
things that the British are putting into place, all of these rules and taxations and things like that in the 1760s. So he becomes involved in smuggling a bit there, which most merchants did. John Hancock's the famous one that we all know. Uh, so that's his approach to going into the revolution. But then his son marries Governor Shirley's daughter. So he's a big loyalist and he's involved in the royal side of the government and actually is exiled to England and never returns. But his son was a medic uh, who became, a, he was still learning to become a doctor and he served at Bunker Hill. So he was actually on the American side saving soldiers and he though he left with his father to England he came back he was able to come back to the U.S. so when he comes back to the U.S. he ends up in Maine and he actually is the one who as a doctor delivered Henry Wadsworth Longfellow who then later wrote the Midnight wow. Ride of Paul Revere so it all comes back to the American Revolution. Oh my goodness <laughs> well this book is full of amazing stories and I do you don't have to be descended from these families to look at this as a model genealogy and a very interesting set of stories. So we will have ordering information at the end just for anyone who wants to be inspired in their own genealogical writing or who finds these stories enticing and they are very enticing. What else did you discover or learn from writing this book, Kyle? Oh, well, I discover you're a little prescient because before the book ever was turned into a book, it was still a manuscript form. You said it would be award winning. So. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I'd forgotten that. So I'm glad I was good to my word. Well, again, congratulations. So you've done a lot of work on cases and uh, obviously book projects. What are some of the interesting stories over the years? Share an anecdote or two about interesting or challenging cases that you've worked on that, that our viewers might be interested in. Well, I'm going to use a little generality here. Uh, what I find both interesting and challenging and ties back to my Ellis Island interest is finding the European origins for our immigrant ancestors. You don't have to be all the way back from the 1600s going back to England. You can be from all kinds of places. So really identifying a specific uh, townland in Ireland or community in Italy, those are the kinds of things that I most enjoy doing. And then I get to have fun learning a new language when I go to read the records over there. So some of the more exciting ones that I have done in recent times, uh, I actually have a book that is at the printer currently. Um, it is the ancestors of uh, Albert Zenick Sr. and Rose Marie Mildred Prince. And both the Zenick and the Prince families were really fun to be able to bring back across the ocean. So on the Zenick side of things, we knew going into this project that the immigrant ancestor had been born in 1890 in a place called Zaluzhi. And believe me, I don't know that I'm saying that right. It's a lot of Z's in there. <laughs> but the problem is there were something like 18 towns with that name in the modern day Czech Republic, the former Bohemia. So we had to send a researcher out to check them off one by one. And I think it was the 11th try that they finally pinpointed the place. And from there, we were not only able to pull this family grouping together, but take it back multiple generations, all the way back to the 1600s, when the ancestor with a different surname moved onto a farm that was named for the Zenic family that lived there and took their surname and then forevermore became the Zenics. Oh, so it was really neat to be able to do that. Well, I know the family is thrilled with the work you've done on it, and that's going to be a great piece of scholarship that will inspire readers too. So, so we're really excited. Can't wait for that to come out. Um, one of the things that you are particularly good at is in working with our patrons and our friends and new members and others who might have an interest in doing their own family histories. And I know you have some upcoming programs that you um, would like to share with our viewers. 
Oh, I do actually. It's starting in fresh in the new year. So if you have a new year's resolution to get yourself started right away in January on the 15th, we are having an online conference that is dedicated to using Microsoft Word to write your family history. And this can be really tricky to people who don't use Word every day. And my favorite thing to do when you use Word is to start with a template of one of the genealogical formats. So if you'd like to write in register style or on and tuple, those are the two main formats. We'll be teaching you how to do that. And then wait a half a year until it's much warmer here in Boston and come in person. From July 14th to the 16th, we are having the Summer Institute for Advanced Researchers that is dedicated to writing your family history. So I'll be looking forward to seeing people face to face for that one. Well, those are, I really commend those to our viewers and hope uh, that you'll consider uh, working with Kyle and learning about what she does. And um, you are, you inspire our members and we're grateful to you. Any parting wisdom? or thoughts to share with our viewers? Well, the main thing is that you can do this. You can put together a scholarly work that will be in libraries that can help other researchers. They may even be just tenuously connected to the families that you hold close to your heart, but they will be useful to others. So you really should do it. And, you know, it's that whole, you said dreams come true earlier. That is so the case for myself because I am now a published author and I spent the early years of my elementary school days telling everyone what I want to be when I grow up as an author. So <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> that is wonderful inspiration. And I couldn't agree more. I've spent years telling people and persuading some people who said, oh, I don't think I can do it. And, you know, we're, we're here to help you. And, um, and it is, and I tell people all the time, your descendant, not only families today or scholars today or tomorrow who are interested in these families or localities will benefit from this. Think of the people in a hundred years who will be so grateful that you did this. And um, so, so Kyle and I get to persuade people to do it. And uh, it's an easy sell because um, because people love family history and and this is one way of making sure it stands the test of time and is available to people now and in the future. So thank you for the great work you do, Kyle, and we hope we'll have you back when some of these other books are published. Oh, I look forward to it. Thank you for speaking with me today. Our pleasure. Take care. Bye bye, everyone.